aqui. Testing one and two, testing one and two. Okay, this is uh, Georgia School of Preaching, week 12, um, in the Ephesians and Philippians class. Last week we started uh, discussing the book of Philippians finally. We'll only get a couple of weeks to do it this week and next week. Uh, and last week we were looking at uh, Verses 1 and 2, looking at the people to, uh, who wrote the book, right? For the person who wrote the book, Paul and uh, Timothy, his uh, associate. Timothy was not a co author, but he was an associate of Paul, at least part of the time that he was in prison. Both are considered bond servants of Jesus Christ. We talked about that. We talked about how uh, what saint is in Christ Jesus. And now we come to. Uh, Discussion of the town of Philippi. The original addressees of the letter are the saints who live in the city of uh, Philippi. Philippi is what you might call, at least at one time, it was uh, begun, you might say, as a boom town. It started as a result of a gold rush, a, as a result of gold and silver being found there. It became a very commercialized uh, center in the ancient world. If you look at a map, uh, which I have here on the board, I don't know if anybody can see it online, I'll just hope that you can. But if you look at the map, you'll see that uh, Italy and uh, Macedonia and uh, Asia Minor all dip down into the Mediterranean uh, Sea. And you'll see between uh, Italy and Macedonia or Greece, uh, the Adriatic Sea, and here between Greece, Corinth, and uh, Asia uh, is the Aegean uh, Sea. You could travel between the continents pretty easily from uh, these these seaports. There are seaports over here. There are seaports over here. Primarily, the business district, you might say, at the world at that time was, was here, traveling back and forth. Uh, you'll find Paul traveling back and forth between Ephesus and, and, and Corinth here in his uh, travel. But at any rate, this is the, the world at that time. You might, might be talking, looking at your map. Over here is Damascus, uh, Jerusalem, Antioch. So here is the, the port, you might say, of Paul's missionary journeys. He left from here going into the other, other parts of uh, the world. So Asia Minor, Greece, uh, uh, Italy, these are all, that's the major part of the biblical world. You can't see it, but down here in the southern part of the Mediterranean Sea is uh, Egypt. But I want to focus on th this part up here where Philippi uh, was. You could travel by uh, sea between the eight, between Greece and Italy, the Adriatic Sea in between uh, Asia and uh, Macedonia or Greece through the uh, Aegean Sea. And that's what most or a lot of folks did, but also you could travel by uh, land. And that's what I'm going to do a second map. This really gives us a good picture of the uh, Ignatian uh, highway that crossed this portion of the world. Here is Philippi here. You, Philippi didn't have really a port from inward or an inland uh, city, not very much inland, but it did. There was a close uh, port, Neapolis, uh, a port here that they could uh, come to uh, Philippi. Neapolis wasn't much more than just a port city. Uh, and then you're going into inland to the actual city of Philippi at that uh, time. So this is where Paul uh, was when he was at Philippi, and you can see his trail down the Ignatian Highway to Thessalonica there, and it continues um, on from east uh, to west, going through the major cities of that time. If you look at the map, you'll notice 
a mountainous uh, region back here, and there is a pass through those mountains here, one here, and I think there's one here, that really Philippi commanded. And that's one of the reasons uh, that Philip of Macedon, the uh, father of uh, Alexander the Great, is one of the reasons he established that city was to command that pass into Europe. If he wanted to go into Europe uh, from that part of the world, that was the way to go. You had to go through Philippi, or Philippi at least guarded those gates, you may uh, you might say, uh, to go into Europe. So you can see why Philippi would be a great place to establish the church, have a good gathering of, of uh, church members because people going east to west here uh, would go through Philippi on the Ignatian way. So they're going to uh, they can get the gospel here and carry it that way, get the gospel here and carry it that way. Or if you're going in, on into Europe, one of the ways to do that, one of the major ways to do it is through this pass that uh, Philippi sort of Guarded, and so the gospel could go north, south, or north, east, and west, not so much south in Philippi because south is the uh, uh, sea. So that's the, the city of Philippi, its location, a strategic location, uh, and, and so forth. If you are a history buff, you might know that this was the uh, Philippi was the uh, location of the Battle of Philippi in 42 uh, BC. This battle was fought just outside of Philippi. You can see here a flat area. This is where the battle was fought. Pretty major uh, battle. There were 36 legions um, there by, uh, to, brought to battle, 110,000 uh, soldiers on one side, 90,000 on the other side. The generals were uh, Octavian and Mark Anthony on the one side and Brutus and Cassius, Julius Caesar's assassins, on the other side. 200,000 people or soldiers fighting in the army. There were some 40,000 casualties. If you have time to Google it or YouTube it, you might you can find uh, reenactments of uh, that battle there on YouTube. Interesting study if you're uh, interested in history. This battle was epic in the sense that uh, it was. It really pictured the end, or at least began was the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic, uh, and was the beginning of the beginning of the Roman Empire. Octavian being the first, uh, ended up being the first uh, in the long line of Roman emperors. Philippi, uh, during the time of Paul, was a Roman colony. Now that may not mean a lot to you and I, but to them it meant a lot. To be a Roman colony at that time meant, uh, gave the city a, a lot of uh, clout. Wherever you were, if you were a Roman colony, whatever city you were, it gave you a lot of clout. Rome would find a, a city in a strategic location. Philippi was uh, that. Uh, and uh, they would send soldiers to uh, that city uh, veteran soldiers, retiring soldiers, they would send them uh, there uh, to establish the city as Roman. If you send three or four hundred families into a location uh, at that time, those cities weren't uh, millions and millions of people back then. So if you send three or four hundred families or soldiers with their families into a, a location, you, you get a pretty good chunk of, of that location being your culture and that's what they did you know it happens here in our culture all the time uh, it's, you know here we live here in atlanta and i noticed that we have uh, hispanic cultures and korean cultures and russian cultures and you go to new york you got little italy you got little china or chinatown things of that nature people go and they congregate in an area where they can communicate uh with each other easily where they can buy and sell products that they like from their uh, previous culture. Well, that's what Rome did. He uh, Rome sent people to Philippi and established it as a Roman colony, a lot of buying and selling Roman products, speaking the Roman language, having Roman uh, politicians. Uh, it, it essentially turned it into a Roman city with Roman culture and Roman lifestyle. Uh, recently, in the last uh, few years anyway, Russia did something like this to take over the Crimea. Crimea 
as part of Ukraine. But over the years, or last few, uh, several decades, Russia has been, you might say, uh, taking advantage of the liberal visa or liberal uh, laws of the Ukraine that coming to Russians coming to visit and stay or move or whatever. The the borders were pretty pretty soft, so Russia just pumped in more and more Russians into the Crimea so that they became pretty predominantly populated by Russians. So when Russia wanted to take over the Crimea, they would just say, we're Russian. We're not Ukraine anymore. That's about how they took it over. Don't want to get into politics. That's what happened at Philippi, not just Philippi, but other cities like that, Roman colonies. And it wasn't something that was a fight about. You know, in Crimea, the Russians and Ukrainians still fight over that issue. But in uh, Philippi, when they came, the, the Romans came and took over, it wasn't such a bad deal because there were benefits to that. They were exempt from Roman taxes. They had the right to govern uh, themselves. They had the protection of the Roman uh, army uh, because they were a Roman uh, colony. These are things that they had and didn't want to lose. So they sort of bowed to Rome, did what Rome wanted to be done there so they could have these uh, benefits. Because if they didn't have these benefits, for example, Rome would tax uh, Philippi heavily and all the money would leave Philippi and go to Rome. But if you are a Roman colony, then you, know, you may have taxes, but if they're taxes that stay in Philippi, it doesn't go back to uh, Rome. So citizens of the Roman colony have the uh, you know, benefits of being uh, a Roman colony, and they are also considered to be Roman citizens. A thing in that world back then uh, was a great that was a great uh, value. Well, all those things are uh, at that time uh, made Philippi something important. They had the gold, they had the, the great battles that were fought there, they had the great founder, Philip of Macedon, they had the strategic location, they had the Roman colony status. None of that is why we remember Philippi uh, today. The, the reason we remember Philippi today is because I got when I have a when I have a uh, 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 Thank you. Microphone is his own. And I'm getting a lot of feedback. You can look at that. If uh, look at this map here, uh a map of that time, you get another picture uh, of Paul's uh journey. Uh it, you look at Philippi, it's right here on uh, map. I had to, in order to uh, find Philippi on the map, on a modern day map, I had to zoom in Google Maps or Google World uh, map. I picture that because mm -hmm. what this was here. I had to zoom it in really, really uh, big to even find a modern uh, city of Philippi. Mostly it's a place for tourists who want to follow in the footsteps of. Uh, Paul, yet these 2,000 years later, the reason that anybody knows anything about Philippi is because of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle of Jesus Christ stopped there, taught and baptized a few people, and wrote them a letter. Otherwise, we wouldn't know Philippi. Uh, yes, there was a great battle fought there, but that, that history died hundreds uh, of years ago. Back in the 4th uh, or 5th century, people couldn't even find Philippi. It's been renovated uh, since then, but it was just forgotten. We know it now today because Paul was there. Philippi is the location of the first Christian church in uh, Europe. It all began in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and Silas, and Timothy, and Luke, and maybe others, we don't know, or I don't know anyway, were traveling from place to place as missionaries spreading the word of Christ. Twice they were forbidden to go to the area we call uh, Turkey. Um, when Paul came to uh, Troas, uh, wondering what their next step would be, the Spirit, by means of it, called them to Macedonia. Now, watch, before I read this text, so watch as uh, the text takes us from place to place. We have Paul starting out over here in uh, Antioch. We're not going to go back that far, but we find him crossing 
this uh, area here coming into what we call uh, Asia with Galatia and Cappadocia and Bithynia and Pontius. Peter wrote to these Christians in his first epistle. But Paul was forbid. Paul wanted to go here and teach the gospel because I guess it was closed. It's on his way, so it's just I'm here to go there. And the, the Spirit forbade him. And so they ended up going over here. They were bypassed the mission. They came to Troas, and the Troas that Paul received a vision. Let's look at that text. And the reason we're doing this is to give you more background into the people and the letter, the reason for its writing, and, and so forth. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse um, 6. And when we had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, go back here. Uh, we don't have fruit written on there, but uh, the region of Galatia, when we had gone through that uh, area, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, that's a strange thing, that they were forbidden to preach in Asia. The Holy Spirit had his reasons. Maybe we can discern that. Maybe we can't. It doesn't matter. If the Holy Spirit says don't, then you don't. And after they came to Mysia, Mysia here is the port city up here on the Miramar uh, Sea, Miramar Sea. Uh, they, came, they came through uh, Mysia uh, and tried to go to Bithynia, which Bithynia is here, several port cities. It's what we call Turkey today. Uh, they tried to go to Bithynia, but again, the Spirit did not permit them. So by passing or passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night, verse uh, 9, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. They wanted to go to Bithynia, couldn't do it. They wanted to go to Galatia, couldn't, or, uh, couldn't do it. But now they have a place to go, so he's jumping on it real quick to go. So uh, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we came, uh, ran a straight course to Samothrace, a little island out there, and the next day came to Neapolis, that little seaport outside of uh, Philippi. From there, we went to Philippi. Uh, and uh, it was the foremost city in that part of Macedonia, a colony, he points out. Uh, and we were staying in that city for some days. We don't know how long it was. It was Paul's custom, typically, to go first to the synagogue, but there is no synagogue in Philippi. It's not very, which means there's not very many Jews there, or at least not many faithful Jews. We just go with that there are not many uh, Jews there because they would have established or built a synagogue. If you have more than 10 families, or 10 families, at least 10 families, you can begin a synagogue according to Jewish rule. Anyway, verse 13, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily had, and we sat down and spoke to the women we met uh, there. The assumption is that this is a Jewish place of worship. Paul, uh, as we said, always went to the Jews first. There were no Jews, or at least no synagogue, in the city of Philippi. So he goes to the riverside on the Sabbath day, so I would assume because he's doing this on the Sabbath day that he was expecting to find something Jewish uh, uh, there, and there were Jews there, uh, at least we assume there were Jews, people who would have held the Sabbath day sacred. They were there where prayer was customarily made. They didn't have a church building, didn't have a synagogue, but apparently the Jews customarily assembled either in this location outside of Philippi uh, at the river or Jews customarily, where there was no synagogue, would assemble at a location by a riverside. There's speculation both ways by historians and uh, commentators as to why they were there at this place where uh, prayer was customarily made. Was it customarily to have a Jewish place of worship by a river where there's a city with no synagogue, or was just this only a Philippi? Uh, situation doesn't matter. They came to a place where prayer was customarily made. We assume that it's Jewish. Uh, and he found here a, a group praying in some sort of devotion uh, to God. And we, while these are assumptions as far as were they Jewish, it doesn't matter. There's no affirmation of that, but it, it's not really that significant to the uh, story or the text. Verse 14 says, now a certain woman named Lydia, we assume Jewish, don't know it, 
A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. Worshiping God doesn't mean that she was Jewish. But Cornelius worshiped God. He was a devout man who worshiped God. He wasn't Jewish. He was a Roman centurion. He was Italian. Uh, the Italian man. Anyway, uh, we find Lydia of Southern Purple Thyatira. She worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. When she had and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me, be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she uh, persuaded. Uh, so let's talk about that phrase just for a moment, that the Lord opened uh, her heart. Is this a miraculous event? Did God miraculously open Lydia's heart so that she would understand or heed the things that Paul said? Is this an occasion for what is termed as a direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon a person's heart? Did God do something for Lydia that he did not do for the other women there? It says only that he opened Lydia's uh, heart. Didn't say he opened the hearts of the other women, but there were other people who were baptized. Is this, as some take, teach, a supernatural event, the likes of which I must wait for if I want to be saved, if I want to be a Christian, if I want to understand the gospel, I have must have some supernatural enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. God must somehow touch my heart. Is that what this text is saying? The Lord opened her heart. It's an important question. In some churches, uh, it is taught that one cannot be saved unless the Lord is in some, has in some way acted upon his or her heart. Is that the teaching of Scripture? Paul says in another place, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for what? It, what is it? The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes you first and also Greek. Is that true? Well, of course it's true. Or is it true that the power of God for salvation is that God must act upon a person's heart? That's what people say happened here in Acts chapter 16. The Lord miraculously opened her heart. If that's the case, then it's not the gospel that's the power of God for salvation. It's God acting upon that person's heart so that they can understand uh, the gospel of salvation. Now, if you are a GSOP uh, student, and you are going to study or have studied the book of Acts, you should cover this more thoroughly than what I'm going to do tonight, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, here. I just wanted to, to mention that the, the text here in Acts is plain enough. The problem is people will yank this portion of the verse, the Lord opened your heart, they'll yank it out of its context, and have a hold of this, this yanked out portion of the context and make a mantra out of it. This is how God saves. This is how God saves. He will, you've got to have your heart opened by the Lord. This is one statement that's yanked out of its context and it doesn't consider the other teachings of the Bible. To repeat what the text actually says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. What happened? She heard us. She was a son of purple from the city of Thyatira. She worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. The first thing that happened was that Lydia heard us. Who? Paul. The consequence of that event was that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things that he had said, heed the things that Paul had said. Well, how did the Lord open her heart? Well, the setting shows us that in my opinion, anyway, the Lord had been working on Lydia's heart or Lydia's life for a long time. Where was she when she heard Paul? Well, she was down by the river at the place of worship, at the place of prayer, and she was worshiping God. God was not something new to her. She would have been readily receptive to Paul if Paul were a, a Jew, and he was, and she were a Jew, we think she was, and he came discussing the things of Jewish law or Jewish uh, religion, she would have been pretty receptive to that because she was Jewish as well as was Paul. She was a businesswoman. We know that she was a seller of purple. She lived in the city of Thyatira, or at least she came from there, and she was a seller of purple. So she was a businesswoman, but instead of being at the market on Saturday, a normal business day for most cultures, Jews were a very small segment of that culture. They're the only ones who worship the seventh day. 
So if she wanted to make a lot of money on Saturday, she should be at the marketplace. But where is she? She's down by the river at the place of prayer. Somebody has already been working on her heart. This is the fact that the Lord opened her heart is not something that necessarily immediately happened at that moment. She had, had as a woman who is a worshiper, worshiper of God, she's observing the Sabbath day. She's devoutly uh, Jewish. She put aside worldly things to go and, and worship God. This shows the nature of her heart. She was a very religious woman. She was a very devout woman. How did she know that she should worship God on the Sabbath day? Had her heart been touched long before this this particular Sabbath day, maybe her parents, God was working on her through her Jewish parents in her childhood. Any number of situations could have uh, occurred that caused her to be a devout worshiper of God on the Sabbath day here on this occasion. Because Paul was a Jew, because he spoke to her of Jewish teachings, because he spoke of the God she worshiped, her heart was open uh, to what he had to say. There did not have to be, what I'm saying, what I'm pointing out here, there doesn't have to be a miraculous touching of the heart by God in order for this event to, uh, for, for the statement to be made, the Lord opened her heart. No intervention, miraculous intervention was necessary for that to take, take place. It's my understanding that the conversion of Lydia is no different from the other conversions that are recorded in the book of Acts. We oftentimes state that Acts is the book of conversions, and the, one of the things that we notice about these conversions is they consistently run the same uh, way. And so her conversion would not, if that's true, be any different than the other conversions, nor would it be or should it be any different from ours. Each of us as a Christian because uh, is a Christian because through a series of we might say providential events, we gained access to and heard the gospel. Take note of the providence that brought Paul to Lydia, or Paul and Lydia together. Three times, God prompted Paul, telling him, don't go to Galatia, don't go to Bithynia, go to Philippi. What's God doing? He's pointing Paul to Lydia. I think very much so. Now, there are other people there that were saved, most likely, uh, and God was pointing them to him too, or pointing Paul to them too, but God was, we can say, pointing Paul, setting Paul's sails so that he would go to Philippi and meet Lydia. Circum similar circumstances can be seen in the conversion of the Roman centurion in Acts chapter 10, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. God intervened to bring the preacher and the preachee, or the person who was being preached to, uh, together. But he didn't operate miraculously on the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch, nor did he operate miraculously upon the heart of the centurion, and nor is it necessary to say that he operated miraculously upon the heart of it. He opened her heart by a series of events that uh, took place to get, to get him to that point. As an illustration, I might ask, how did I come to be in Russia or when I was in Russia? Now, as I reflect back on the events that put me in Russia, I think God was very much moving in my life providentially, not miraculously, but providentially, to lead me to Russia. And I think he was doing that not just at the time that I went to Russia, but even early in my life when I was a child. I remember, remember hearing men pray about people behind the Iron Curtain who, who, who need the gospel. And, and we, we, we prayed that prayer, or it was prayed as I was coming up as a boy uh, in church. We, that prayer was prayed often, and I, I remembered it. I didn't understand it, but I remembered it. And when I got old enough to understand, then I had a particular interest of those, in those people behind the Iron Curtain. And then it was about that same time that Reagan was president, Gorbachev was president, and the Eastern or the German Wall came down and the Russian borders opened up, and boom, we went to Russia. Was it just a coincidence? Or was God leading providentially in uh, my life me to go to there and reach the people that I reached? Two people can hear the same gospel, one respond to it and another not because one has, through a series of events, been prepared for the gospel and one through a series, through a lack of those same series of events or a rejection of those events that God tried to work out in his life, did not. 
It's not because one is chosen by God and the other is not. It's not because God operates upon the heart of one and, and not the other. The Calvinistic teaching that uh, God selects this group of people and does not select this group of people and those two groups cannot be changed over one way or the other, whether you accept or don't accept the gospel, it doesn't matter if you're in this group, you're saved in this group, you're, you're not. And this, the Lord opened her heart, uh, fits into that in, in, in some way, but it doesn't have to be a miraculous event. It doesn't, has, it doesn't have to be a God choosing her above, above someone else. It's simply and accurately stated, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things that she had heard Paul say. The opening of her heart had been taking place, I think, for a long time. I'm not going to go into a lot uh, any more on that. Just to say that this is not a miraculous event, uh, and I think it's pretty easily proven, but you will hear it talk otherwise. Lydia and her household, um, as a result of heeding the things Paul spoke, were baptized, and so the church of our Lord is established in Philippi, the first church on the European continent. In verse 15, it says, and when her household, uh, when her household, uh, she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if, we have if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house, and so she persuaded us. They returned to the place of uh, prayer, it seems, um, and it says in verse uh, 16, now when it happened, as we went to prayer, it happened as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim us to us the way of salvation. Long story short is Paul did not want this demon-possessed girl affirming who he was. Just like Jesus didn't want demons affirming who he was, Paul did not want demons affirming who, it was, who he was. He didn't want to make it look as if he were in concert with uh, the, the, this demon because everybody recognized she was demon-possessed. Whatever that meant to them, they knew that she was crazy or she was of the devil or of some demonic source or bad God source. And Paul didn't want her uh, reputation that way being associated, or his re reputation being associated with it. So he did the only thing he could do or should do, and that was he cast the demon out of her. I would like to think that as a result of this uh, event, this mm -hmm. young lady was converted, but we're not told one way or the other. We're told that the men who had been using her, her demon possession as a circus act for profit were not happy about what happened. So it says they brought them to the magistrates. They brought Paul and Silas to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, listen to them, being Romans to receive and observe. This is what got the magistrates upset because if Paul and Silas were teaching something against what Romans should do, this could interfere with, if Rome got wind of it, or the authorities got wind of it, this could interfere with Philippi's uh, Roman citizenship, or not Roman citizenship, Roman uh, colonization uh, status. So they didn't want to risk that. That's why the magistrates get in, involved. The accusation shows us, however, that Paul and company had been busy in the city teaching uh, the gospel because it wasn't just this one event but several things had taken place for the people to understand that the, these men will uh, exceedingly trouble our city teaching customs that are not lawful for us being Romans so uh, apparently these these men had heard and others likely had heard Paul speaking not just casting out the demon that's not the only thing that they had seen or witnessed but at any rate the result was that Paul and Silas were beaten thrown in jail which results in the second recorded conversion in Philippi, that of the Philippian jailer. So these two, the church then is comprised of these two families, at least. One Jewish, one Gentile, if Lydia was Jewish. They apparently met in Lydia's house. This kind of tells us that she was a woman of means, a woman of wealth, a house large enough at least for the church to assemble in its birth. So this is the birth of the church to whom 
Paul writes the letter that we are beginning to study. A bond formed between this church that the only makeup we know of at this point is Lydia's household and the jailer's household. And I have no doubt there were others, but that's all that we know of at this point. But a bond formed between this church and Paul. I don't think we have to think of it as a big church that uh, had a uh, once a week relationship with the preacher. That's not the kind of bond we're talking about here. It's deeper than that. It started out as two families who had witnessed firsthand the, the love and the care and the tenderness and and the zeal of Paul for, for God and for the gospel. They witnessed firsthand his sacrificial spirit. While he was preaching the gospel, he got beaten and thrown in jail, but he didn't cause a big fuss about this. He didn't throw a tantrum about this. He didn't. They, they witnessed Paul being controlled by the gospel, by being filled with the gospel to the extent that he gave or was willing to give his life for it. Half of the original church members, uh, were uh, Paul were there with Paul as he were was beaten and thrown in jail. This is not a uh, typical Jewish Gentile situation, and I don't know why. It may be because there was no synagogue, and therefore there were not a lot of men, or vice versa, there were not a lot of men, so there wasn't a Jewish synagogue. But at any rate, the Jewish sentiment uh, sentiment that often plagued Paul was not uh, there. And so there wasn't a Jew slash Gentile division in this church. It was just people, some who were Jews, some who were Gentiles, coming together to, to worship God, people who had a great love for Paul in the some days that he stayed there. So the church was born with both joy and sorrow. The joy of becoming Christians, the joy uh, being Christian, but also the sorrow of watching uh, Paul be treated as he was. Back in the book of Philippians, in addition to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, Paul writes, with bishops and deacons. The indication, or this indicates that a time of growth and maturity had taken place since Paul was there. I think it's probably been about 10 years since Paul was there. And during that time, bishops and deacons had been organized in uh, the church. And these few, or as there were few Jewish men, if any, uh, were not, none are recorded. There may have been some anyway, uh, just not recorded. The likelihood is that these elders and these deacons were Gentiles. And that's significant, that they could develop in a 10-year period from being pagans, from being a, a jailer who was fully Roman and therefore fully pagan, most likely, worshiping the uh, emperor. From him to go from that point to being an elder in the church in 10 years, that's significant. That says it was done purpose, purposely. And a lot of times we have churches, and this is a shame, a great shame for the Lord's church. We're here in our country where Christianity has been in observance for the 200 years plus of its existence, we have people in the church who have been in the church for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but the church has no elders. It cannot be. It simply cannot be. There's no excuse for it. Uh, God intends that a church have elders. We, have the, we make the excuse, well, we don't have men who are qualified. Why don't you have men who are qualified? This church in 10 years had men who were qualified. They had men who had come from paganism to the point of being elders in the church in 10 years. It's a sermon that needs to be preached, gentlemen. We need to have elders in the Lord's church. It needs to be that we have elders in the Lord's church. Now, there may be times and occasions where there are not, but it needs to be in those times and occasions where there are not that we are diligently working toward that end. And I don't see it happening. I see us being content with committees uh, and uh, committees of deacons, they, uh, they say, or you know, a preacher running the show, uh, whatever the, the, the situation is, if we're content with it, without it being elders, I think we are in sin. Now, I'm not saying it's sinful to be without an eldership. I'm saying it's sinful to be content to be without an eldership. We need to be working on that. Anyway, I stray. Um, as we... Uh, Read this letter. We're going to see this bond between Paul and this group of people. 
Uh, over the years, we'll see that they uh, sponsored his ministry with uh, many uh, gifts on the occasion of writing. Uh, they have heard of his imprisonment in, in Rome, so they send him a gift. They also send him one of their members. And it just continues to show or shows the continued fellowship and great concern they have for Paul. What Paul does in writing this letter is basically say, thank you. He thanks them and he tells them, don't be concerned about my situation. Uh, and there's where we're going to see the theme of, uh, of joy. He understands from their communication that they are anxious about his well-being, so he tells them, Things, no, they're not great physically for me right now, but I have great reason to rejoice in the Lord. So he encourages them, don't be anxious over physical, physical circumstances, but to rejoice and to rejoice always in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Coming to verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Another translation says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, the New American Standard. The New Living Translation says, every time I thank you, think of you, I give thanks to my God. These words are not lightly spoken nor are they lightly spoken when Paul writes very similar words to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to Thessalonians, to Timothy, and to Philemon. Try to think of someone you met 10 years ago. Maybe you uh, taught them the gospel, uh, taught them the Bible uh, in, a, in a Bible study. Maybe you baptized them into Christ. Was that person just another number to add to the church role? Or did that did you invest your life into that person? Was their baptism just another notch on your belt? Or do you remember fondly the time that you spent with them and intently studied the gospel and studied the Bible to help them see the love that God has for them as you drew them to the Lord? Did you get involved in their life? Did they get involved in your life? Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He's not just saying this just to have nice flowery words to say to these people. He thanked his God upon every remembrance of them. When Paul was out there teaching the gospel, evangelizing, he was not on a campaign to rack up a bunch of baptisms. In fact, he told the Corinthians, he said, I'm glad that I baptized none of you except the ones that he said that he actually did baptize, which were few. He wasn't out to rack up a number of baptisms. I mean, he was out there to bring people to the Lord. He was out there to have these relationships with these people who were Christians. The people to whom he writes are people into whom he invested his life and they are a constant part of his thoughts and prayers. When he did not write such flowery words to the Galatians, that does not mean that they were not a part of his life or that they were not a part of his thoughts. It means he was angry with them and asked them, why are you so easily bewitched? He, he would not have been upset. There would have been no reason for him to be upset had he not been there in, in, in Galatia and had he not invested his, his life or invested himself into them while he was there. He wasn't just a preacher passing from place to place, not getting to know the people. Ten years later, Paul still fondly remembers these people in Philippi, and he prays for them. doesn't mean that he thought about them all the time, but when he did think of them, he was grateful to God for the relationship. Wearsby says Paul uses three thoughts in verses 1 through 11 that describe true Christian fellowship. Number one, he says, I have put you in my mind, verses 3 through 6. Number two, he says, I have put you in my heart, verses 7 through 8. And number three, I have you in my prayers, Philippians 9 through 11. I think that's pretty uh, good assessment of those uh, verses. Strauss remarks that the body, I'll read this to you. The body of the letter is introduced at first, at verse 3, and it commences on a note of praise. 
And he writes, my own heart is blessed as I write by the mere thought of this strange combination of persecution and praise. Paul the prisoner, in bonds for the defense and confirmation of the gospel, begins the body of his epistle rejoicing in his soul. Get that again. Paul the prisoner begins the epistle by rejoicing in his soul while he is a prisoner. And he makes this comment. He says, nowhere in the religious writings of the world outside of the Bible does one find evidence of inner peace and praise under such provocation. And the reason, he says, uh, Strauss says, is, is obvious. No religion outside of Christianity can produce transformation of one's life equal to that of the Holy Spirit in the act of regeneration. None but a child of God, in the will of God, can count it all joy when he comes uh, by varied trials and a, of, a, of a troublesome life. James chapter 1, verse 2, he quotes, or he refers to. Approximately 10 years, continuing in the Reap Strauss's comments, approximately 10 years had passed since the fellowship began from the first day until now it has continued, and he says it's an indication of a spirit-controlled heart, and that's exactly the way it should be. He concludes, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit began with the continuing spirit, this continuing spirit in the lives of, the, of new converts, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued what? Steadfastly in what? In fellowship and in prayers. I think that's a pretty remarkable comment. That the fellowship and prayers that we continue in, that we should continue in, is something we do because we are indwelt by the very Spirit of God. We are being transformed by the very Spirit of God. We don't act like the world anymore. That doesn't mean we don't go stealing and killing and, and raping and all that. We don't do that either. But we don't act like the world. We act like God. And because we act, we act like God because we are being transformed by His Spirit or by the Word of His Spirit. Don't look for some miraculous event or don't try to interpret me as saying that the Spirit's going to miraculously change. That's not a miracle the way He's doing it. It is supernatural. But I don't think it's miraculous. It happens through the Spirit-given Word of God. Matt Chandler writes in this same area, Philippians is the only letter we have in scriptures in which Paul is not trying to correct bad teaching or rebuke bad behavior. Instead, he says, the letter highlights Paul's personal affection for the Philippian church and his commendation of and exhortation toward their Christian maturity. It may be, Chandler says, that this letter is the best New Testament picture we have of what a maturing church looks like and what maturing people do. I think that's a great comment, a great uh, assessment. He goes on to say, as a result, the letter to the Philippians overflows with Paul's heart of affection for them. He considers the Philippians not just sheep in his care, but friends in his heart. And in this book, he wears his heart on his sleeve. That's quoted from Matt Chandler's book, The Life or To Live as Christ to Die as Game. West says the word all, there in verse 3, or every, depending upon your translation, I thank my God upon every or all remembrance of you. He says the word in the Greek text has the idea of whole, the whole memory I have of you, every memory I have of you. I thank my God for all the memory that I have of you. Paul thanks God uh, with because, uh, for the Philippians because of what he remembers, all that he remembers about that. There was no negativity. There were no negative thoughts that came, that came to Paul's mind when he thought of, of the Philippians. And that's really significant, significant in that one of the Christians there, probably one of the foremost uh, Christians there, was the one who was his uh, Jailer maybe involved one the one one of who was involved in the beating of Paul. 
I'm thanking my God constantly for my whole remembrance of you is the idea. In every prayer of mine, making supplication for you with joy. Duncan says uh, on this phrase, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. He says, in other words, Paul is saying that when he call, recalls the love of the Philippians, when he recalls the support of the Philippians, when he remembers the Philippians, it leads him to thanksgiving to God. Every time he thinks of them, he thanks God for them. The apostle had a special relationship with this congregation. He seems to be on the same wavelength with this congregation. They, they, they think alike, they feel alike, or at least toward each other. And so his fellowship with them is, is especially sweet. And so when he thinks about them, when he thinks about the, the work of the gospel in them, when he thinks about their participation uh, with him in the work of the gospel, it leads him to thanksgiving to God. Also, Paul, I believe, in making this statement is modeling for us an attitude of thanksgiving, an act of uh, thanksgiving. Every blessing that comes to him, he does not take it for granted. Even the blessing of fellowship with people that he had not seen for 10 years. He does not feel entitled to receive this blessing. He feels thankful to God that he has this blessing. He does not approach that blessing as if I deserve it. The Lord uh, did that for me. That's his job. No, for Paul, quoting uh, again from Duncan, for Paul, those blessings overflow in thanksgiving. And I want to say to you, my friends, that that kind of thanksgiving needs to characterize our prayer in our life attitude. Amen to that. Pritchard, on praying for, for or against someone, makes this statement. Whenever you pray for someone, begin by being thankful to God for them. He says, thank God for the role they've played in your life. Thank God for all that they've done for you. Thank God for the good things they've done for others. Even if, he, and I like what he says here, even if you're having conflict with this person, thank God that he or she is giving you the opportunity to grow spiritually, to learn forgiveness, or to learn to be more patient. God could be using the difficulty that you're having in a relationship with someone to better you as a person, to, to continue the process of regeneration of youth can continue the process of transforming you he uses an event in your life that's caused a stumble in a relationship with someone to bring that about he says if you try you can find something to be thankful about for just about anyone anyone can anyone he says can pray against another person but only god can give you the grace to pray for them instead quoting from his book, Joyful Living in a Grumpy World. I think it's a pretty good title for the book. Spurgeon says, all Paul's memory of Philippi excited gratitude in his mind. He could not have said this of the Galatians. I thank my God for every remembrance of you. Rather, he said to them, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So there's a difference between the relationship. Paul, oh, I would think, yearned or longed for that relationship with the Galatians, but because they were so easily bewitched, uh, he did not. The Greek uh, word eucharisto is the word uh, that at its core means to acknowledge how good grace is. Eucharisto is the word I thank, uh, my God, I thank eucharisto, you meaning good, charisto meaning grace, or the word that's translated uh, grace, good grace, or good words about uh, grace. I, uh, uh, good words of grace. I thank my God for the grace that he has bestowed upon me. Grace is commonly defined as unmerited faith. And it's a good definition, but it, it, it doesn't really easily apply to our lives. A more pragmatic definition of grace is this one that I found. Listen to it. Defining grace, God's supernatural power and provision via his Holy Spirit who exerts his influence upon souls, turning them to Christ, 
keeping them in Christ, strengthen, strengthening them in Christ, and growing them in Christ likeness. I don't know who came up with that definition, but I think it's really good if you, uh, if he was thinking in miraculous terms, I don't agree with him, but I think that very definition, let me read it to you again, but that very definition happens through the soul and spirit transforming word of the spirit of God, or the word of God. Listen to the definition again, thinking of it happening through the, whole, the, the word of God. Spirit of God working through the Word of God. God's supernatural power and provision via His Holy Spirit who exerts His influence upon souls turning to Christ, and I would say there through the Word, keeping them in Christ, strengthening them in Christ, and growing them in Christ. God's supernatural power enables and empowers believers, giving them not just the power, but the desire to live a supernatural life for the sake of Christ and the glory of the Father, and He does that through this wonderful thing we call the Bible. Brothers and sisters, preachers, young and old, the Bible is not just words on paper that give the preacher something to talk about for an hour on Sunday. These are the very words of God, given by the grace of God that we might become like him, that we might glorify him, that we might and that we have the power to accomplish the things that he has for us to do. The Bible's not a toy. The Bible's not a book just to keep decorate your coffee table. The Bible's not a book to throw in the dash of your car after Sunday's over. It needs to be written upon our heart. Its message needs to be written upon our hearts. If it's not, there is no power to change us into what God wants us to be. The book's not going to do it by itself. And memorizing a verse here and a verse there is not going to do it. We have to respect the Word of God for what it is. It is the power of God to transform who we are to what we should be. Mark MacArthur notes about this Greek word, Eucharisto, from which we get the word Eucharist in the English language that's often used of the Lord's Supper. He says, in that ordinance, the Eucharist, believers give thanks to God in remembrance of Christ's substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. In this instance, he says, Paul gives thanks for his spiritual brothers and sisters in Philippi who over the years have brought him such abundant blessing and joy. So as you read this book, the book of Philippians, as you read the prison epistles in general, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, don't forget that it is from prison that he is writing this. He uses this word Eucharisto, I thank God, and he uses the word joy, translated joy, on several occasions in the book, that he's writing this from prison, chained to a Roman guard. Don't forget that. I think it's great that they are qualified to prison epistles, but don't just let that be a label stuck on there so that you have some way to uh, categorize it. They were prison epistles. Prison is not a place that is conducive to cries of praising God and of thanking God. This begs the question. How is this humanly possible that Paul, having been in prison for preaching the gospel now for four years under a false accusation, he's been in prison for four years. How is it humanly possible after all that he had been through that he can maintain an attitude of praise and thankfulness and say, I thank my God upon every number of you. I tell you how it's humanly possible. It's not humanly possible. It's only possible through the Spirit of God transforming Paul from what he was before he became a Christian to what he is when he sits in prison writing a letter to people he hadn't seen in 10 years saying, I thank my God for every remembrance of him. When we allow the Spirit to fill us in the way that the Bible speaks of this, when we allow the Spirit to control us 
and the way that the Bible speaks of that event, he transforms us from our prisons to praise and services. Listen to what Paul says in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, a passage that has become very dear to me. He says, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, he's speaking to the Colossians now, still from prison, for this reason, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with, we talked about this, I think, in the book of Ephesians, this word filled with means controlled by, to ask that you may, we ask God that you may be filled with to the point that you are controlled by it, the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, when that happens, Paul says, when I am filled with the knowledge of God's will, the spirit given the spirit word, given word. in all of wisdom and spiritual understanding, I will be able, Paul says, to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. I will be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, and I will be strengthened with, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Listen to it, for all patience and long suffering with joy. You want to know why the church is not producing anything? They're not filled with the word of God. You want to know how people in the church don't know anything about God today? They're not filled with the Word of God. You, know, you want to know why we're not strengthened with might that we might be able to endure long with long suffering and joy, persecution? We're not filled with the Word of God. How was Paul able to say, I thank my God, sitting in a Roman prison, chained to a Roman guard, because he was filled with knowledge of God's word with all wisdom, with all uh, wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's how it happens. And that's how it will happen today. Paul's not a special case. Paul's a perfect example, or a wonderful example. But you can be that example. But it has to be upon your willful filling yourself being controlled by, to the point that you're being controlled by, the knowledge of his will and all spiritual understanding. I thank my God, he says. My God. Think with me about the significance of those two terms. Well, actually, let's take a break. Uh, 7.30. Uh, so, actually, 7.33. I'll take a break. Have a Drink of water and then we'll come uh, come back. Give me about five minutes. At the rate that we're going, you obviously know that we're not going to uh, finish the book of uh, Philippians. I want to get as far as I can. I have a, you know, I need to learn to be a better teacher to cover the material in the time that I'm given, but by now I'm not that better teacher. But what I do want to do in my teaching is rather than, I think I've mentioned this to you before, rather than give you um, not very much information about a lot of text. I would rather give you a lot of information about a little text so that you're thoroughly acquainted with that portion of text. And maybe by applying the same principles of study, you can gather that same kind of information about the rest of the text, but I hope that we can become very acquainted with the text that we cover. That's why I spend so much time like I do. That's how I've learned, and hopefully I can teach you the way I've learned. And it took me... 30 years to get here, we're not going to get here in the six weeks or eight, 15 weeks, or however many it was, 13 weeks of our class. What I get 20 years, 30 years. Anyway, uh, back in verse 3, Eucharisto, I thank my God. I want you to think about that term, the significance of those ter that term, my God. Other than our Lord Jesus, Paul, is the only one who uses the term my God in the New Testament. 
Not that others didn't have that same relationship with God, but Paul uh, is the only one outside of the Lord on the cross who referred, uses this term, my God. He didn't say, I thank God, which would have been appropriate. But he says, I thank my God. God was his God. This speaks of assurance. It speaks of intimacy. God was not a distant God for Paul. One of the problems in Colossae, we won't spend any time on that, but one of the problems in Colossae was that God was considered by the philosophers or the false teachers to be a distant deity, and you had to go through angels or demigods or other things in order to be able to finally, if ever, get to that God. And so God was never considered by those people as my God. They couldn't have that intimacy. But Paul wants us to understand that the relationship I have, he has, and we can have too, with God is that he is my God. He is my father. He is my friend. He is close to me, or I am close to him. God was Paul's God by choice, by covenant, and by, by con confession, but he was Paul's God. That phrase implies an unbroken fellowship, a fellowship unbroken by unconfessed sin. I have no secret sin, so I can refer to him as my God. He was not uh, being duplicitous. He was not being hypocritical, saying, well, yeah, I worship God on Sunday, but I do this on whatever day. He is my God. We are all the time. He is my God. And I wonder if in our terminology, when we talk about God this and God that, but we seldom use the phrase, my God. Is it because we don't have that personal relationship with God? Is it because we've kept God at a distance because we know we have secret sins in our lives that we have not confessed and we're afraid to or don't feel worthy of being in an intimate relationship with this person, this being, <coughs> this being, my God. Well, the only time we get we say my God anymore is when we're surprised at something. Oh my God. And that's almost blasphemous. Well, not blasphemous, but sacrilegious. Maybe we don't feel close to him because we keep things in our hearts and in our lives that keep us from having that relationship with God. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, that um, he refers to the gospel as my gospel. Here he refers to God as, as, as my God. And I think the relationship between Paul and the gospel and Paul and God were just that intimate as we described. Martin Luther uh, said that Christianity is a religion of personal pronouns. I think that's pretty neat. Anyone can say gospel or God, but only a Christian, he says, can say my gospel or my God. And only we can say that by the grace of God. Thank you, God, that we can call you my God. And Paul's last known communication before he was martyred, he was writing to uh, Timothy. I want you to listen to some of the things that Paul said to, to Timothy. Yeah. I suffer these things. Paul was about to die as a prisoner. He knew it. He knew that there was not going to be an escape this time. I suffer these things, but Timothy, I am not ashamed. Why? For I know what I believe. That's not what he said. He says, for I know whom, not what, not just the doctrine about God, but I know the person I have believed, or the being I have believed, and I am convinced, interesting study of that word there, we won't go into, I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul had great confidence in this being, not just the doctrine that he believed about God or about the church or about Christ. I have great confidence in this person in whom I believe, in this person in whom I have placed all my confidence. I wonder, have we so possessed the gospel? Have we so possessed our relationship with God that they can have, in fact, possessed us as 
falling case. Why was Paul so in, able to endure with joy the sufferings and trials that he endured? It's because his gospel and his God had so completely taken possession of him. And brothers and sisters, that can be our language as well. We have to make that choice. Herrick says the use of my God um, is not in, position, in opposition to your God or in opposition to pagan gods. He's referring to the close personal relationship he enjoys with the one God of the universe who has made himself known particularly, particularly in Christ Jesus the Lord. I don't know who said it, but I like this statement. The author says that Paul, a persecutor of the church formerly, could now call God my God, and a despised Moabitess named Ruth could call Naomi's God my God. That is a resounding testimony to the magnanimous, uh, incomprehensible love magnanimous and comprehensible love, mercy, and grace of the Father who through his son's sacrifice chose to bring those who were once so far away to a place so near and so dear to his heart, so near in fact that we might affectionately call him my God. Indeed, he says, what the author says, the writer of Hebrews says, ours is so great a salvation. I like that. Again, quoting Spurgeon, he says, while the atheist says no God and the heathen worships many gods, the true believer says, oh God, thou art my God. He is so by choice, covenant, and by the Psalm 63, we read, Oh God, there's a song in our hymn books, and I almost want to sing it when I sing read this song. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power, to see your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate upon you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadows of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds you. Again, quoting from West, he explains the word upon. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Uh, he says it means, has the idea of upon the basis of. I thank my God upon the basis of my remembrance of you. And again, that word every carries the idea of hold all the remembrance of uh, you. It's, um, uh, it's my computer says my internet connection is becoming unstable so I may lose you. I don't know. My apologies if that takes place. Paul thanks God because of his remembrance of the Philippians. His whole remembrance. There was no regret in Paul's relationship uh, with them. It's, uh, it's been stated that the church of Philippi never gave Paul reason for uh, anxiety. Most of the churches founded by him uh, lay heavily upon his heart from time to time. They were uh, quarreling with one another. Uh, he had to be a peacemaker. They were involved in wrongdoing and he had to go and, and be a, 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 a rod to them. The, the, the Philippian church was not like that. They were, uh, it was a relationship of, of peace, of growth, maturity, of strength. There were no wranglings or dissensions, or if there were, there were few, to say the least. There was that event or occasion in chapter 4 between the two women, but apparently it was not pervasive. Paul could say 
He only got joy and comfort from this church, and so he thanks God for that. With the little record that we have, try to see what it was that Paul was remembering. Just think about it. Imagine in your mind that Sabbath day on which he went down to the river to the place of prayer, to Lydia's open heart, to Lydia's open home, her devoted family, probably an extended uh, family situation. And then there's that girl that was demon possessed. I like again to think that she was uh, grateful enough for his intervention in her life that she became a, an eventual convert. And then there was the jailer who washed his wounds, fed him a fine meal in his home. There at uh, Acts chapter 16, again, going back there just for a moment, it says, Now when we, he that is the jailer, had brought them to his house, he set free before him and rejoiced. That word rejoice, agalea, was one of my favorite Greek words. It means jumping for joy, joy. He was jumping, he rejoiced. He had a jumping for joy, joy. Paul was there witnessing that. Can you imagine Paul just being excited and uh, along with this, this man? He had found Christ. He, he wasn't raised up in Judaism and knew about the, the coming Messiah. He wasn't raised up in Judaism knowing about God. He learned from Paul that there is a God who cares enough to send his son to die in my place. That's what this jailer knew. And he had... When he learned this, when he learned that there was a, a being out there, a real being, not just a carved image, but a real being, not just the mystics and the snake handlers of the day, but a real being who truly loves him. He, agaliao, he had a jumping for joy, joy. Then there's that final meeting as Paul left Philippi. It says, so they went out of the prison, entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Departing from a mission field is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Because on that mission field, those people were my family. I was loved by them. I loved them. And this parting here, I know it wasn't just a see you later. It was an emotional, an emotionally charged event. Paul's remembering that. I thank my God upon every remembrance. MacArthur said that the real key to joy in a Christian's life is uh, to be able to recall the goodness of people. I like that. To be able to recall the best in someone. To be able to look past some of the glitches in life and capture the sweet memories. That's the joy of the Christian life. The heart where the joy of the Holy Spirit dominates like it did in Paul. Uh, uh, did in Paul. And a heart, it is a heart that touches the sweet things of life, not the bitter things. It savors the thoughts of others' goodness and of others' kindness and of others' love and others' compassion and others' gentle, gentleness and others' sacrifice and others' care. And it forgets all the rest. There's a Christian's joy. That's why we can be joyful. That's why we should be joyful, because these things are taking place. When these things are taking place, don't expect joy to be in the church. Expect what we oftentimes see, people frowning, people watching the clock, people not having associations outside the 10 o'clock service on Sunday. There's no joy in that, or little anyway. MacArthur also says that it can be easily discerned if the heart is... Uh, controlled by the Spirit of God, by the amount of joy in his life. The tendency, he says, is always to focus on everyone's unkindness and ungratefulness or ingratitude and faults and wounds that they've inflicted upon us. But he says, learn to walk in the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Learn to yield to the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. The Spirit of God has a way of erasing negative things. But you got to walk with the Spirit. you got to walk in the Spirit. you got to yield to the Spirit. As a young man, I didn't understand all that. But as I've matured in Christ, I, I realize if I will yield to the Spirit, let the things that I've been preaching about and talking about and reading about in the Bible, let them actually 
take place in my life. Lay myself upon that altar and let God do this through his word. It'll change my relationships. It'll change my life. I'll be filled with joy. Well, verse 4. Philippians 1, verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you, for you all, good southern y'all, always making my request for y'all with joy. The NSA, the New, New American Standard, says always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. The Amplified Bible says in every prayer of mine, I always make my entreaty and petition for you with all joy or delight. The ESV says, always in every prayer of mine, making uh, for you all, making my prayer with joy. And the New English Translation says, I always pray with joy in every prayer for all of them. That word, always. In classical Greek or non uh, outside the Bible. This word would be used uh, to describe a persistent cough, always coughing, without ceasing coughing. You ever had a persistent cough that just wouldn't go away, maybe for weeks or whatever, just wouldn't go away? You cough, 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 cough. I don't want you to associate this verse with coughing, but I want you to associate this word with, <clears throat> that's how it was, a persistent always making a treaty of petition. Paul prays for them. His prayers for them were as persistent as a persistent cough when a cough is persistent. Paul labors to show them, I never forgot you. He always remembers them in his prayers. Griffith Thomas says, Paul, while reaching multitudes by his preaching, continually reached far more or certainly, I'm sorry, certainly reached far more by his prayers. He says, prayer moves the arm that moves the world. All of us have the unfathomable, valuable ministry of intercessory prayer. So may God's Spirit continually fill us with, uh, fill us, enabling us to pray for others without ceasing, like a persistent cough. Pray for others. In a similar comment, uh, Winham says, preaching is a rare gift. Prayer is rarer still. Preaching like a sword is a weapon to those, a uh, weapon to use at close quarters. Those afar off cannot be reached by it. Prayer has a longer range, and under some circumstances, even more effect is even more effective. An infallible test of godly joy, MacArthur says, is the degree to which a believer prays more earnestly for the benefit and blessing of others than for his own. Prayer ministry. Paul had it. Had a preaching ministry. We talked about this in the very introductory part of the uh, course. He had a preaching ministry, but he also had, and it's so apparent in these books, these letters, he had a praying ministry. The word prayer generally refers to specific uh, supplications, prayer uh, addressed to God uh, with, with an urgency arising from a, a personal need. But in this case, the prayers were for someone else's, urgent, an urgency for someone else's personal need. The word comes from the Greek word, which means to want or to, to lack or to be in, it, be in need of. So I, I pray for that which I'm lacking or someone else is lacking, but that which I have in need of or someone else is in, in need of. It gives rise to the word uh, request and beseech. The Greek word order, I think, is very interesting. I have it here. Um, I thought I had it up and highlighted. Yeah, there it is. Meta uh and I can't hardly pronounce that last word, koyomenos, po, uh, with joy, the prayer making. That's the, the, we don't always follow the Greek word order because it doesn't always flow into the English language as well because the Greek and English language have a different form of writing. Uh, ours is dependent upon 
the subject and verb agreement. There is as well, but it's more the endings of the word. I'm not going to go into that. The uh, uh, word, the, the phrase here, as it's translated in Greek, with joy, the prayer making gives us the emphasis of the the joy that should you know, with joy the prayer making, not just prayer making, but with joy making prayers. This word was uh, prayer was the one used by the uh, angel who assured that uh, the, the godly father of John the Baptist when it says, do not be afraid, stop being fearful, indicating that he was fearful. Do not be afraid, Zacharias. For your petition, there's the word, your prayer, your daisies, your petition, your need for your wife's womb to be open, that you have spoken, your desired your request has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. So the idea is an urgent need. Zacharias and Elizabeth had an urgent need, and they kept presenting that need to the Father. Luke uses this word of the disciples of John who were said to fast often and offer prayers, often or offer uh, requests, uh, desires, things that they urgently uh, needed. This word was used by Paul in uh, his prayer for salvation of the, his fellow Israelites. Remember in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer, my urgent need that I speak to God, that I request to God, my urgent need is that uh, to God for Israel is that they may be saved. The prayer is, is, is asking for something, and in this case, it's the asking of something for someone else. Uh, and if Paul's theme is joy, joy in the spirit, spirit-filled joy, then maybe a connection should be made between joy and pray for the needs of others rather than as usual the needs of ourselves. But, my God, I want every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine making requests with joy for you. In quoting from MacArthur, he says, the passions of a person's heart will come out in his prayers. If you examine what you pray for and find you praying only for your needs, your problems, your questions, your struggles, that's an indication of where your heart is. If you pray for infrequently or briefly in a uh, shallow manner, you have a cold heart because your prayer is um, not an inner desire. Lack of prayer doesn't mean that a person is merely disobedient, he says. It indicates selfishness because of a cold heart. <laughs> Stephen Cole writes, if you're having trouble with another believer, even if it's your mate or family member, pray often for that person. It's hard to stay angry for at someone uh, you're praying for. He quotes uh, Boyce saying, I think that 90% of all the divisions between true believers in this world would appear entirely different if Christians or disappear entirely if Christians would learn to pray specifically and constantly for one another. Amen to that. All prayers were with joy. Meta Karas, with joy. He, here is the first occurrence of joy in the uh, letter. Uh, the theme is constantly joy, 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 joy. Mingo says the sum of the epistle is I rejoice, rejoice ye. It's pretty good. Look at this statement. It's written on the uh, board. So whether you agree with it or not, well, you can't tell me that, but think about it. The level of a person's spiritual character or uh, strength is seen by what it takes to steal their joy. Let me repeat that. Think about it. See if you agree with it or not. The level of a person's spiritual character, the level of a person's spiritual strength 
is seen by what it takes to steal their joy. You can find out how mature you are. You can find out how spirit controlled you are. You can find out how spiritually virtuous you are by finding the breaking point where joy is lost and bitterness, negativism, a critical spirit, or sullenness begins to creep in and take over your life. The measure of your joy is how you react not to things the way you'd like them to be, but to, to things the way you wouldn't like them to be. According to the author of that statement, the thing that takes away my joy, the thing that turns me into a bitter person, the things that give me a, a critical spirit, that's the thing that shows me who I really am. It shows my spiritual character, my spiritual maturity or lack thereof. What makes you complain? Think about it. Don't just blow it off. Think about it. What makes you complain? What makes you whine? What makes you, what really pushes your buttons? What really makes you angry to the point that you will sin? Whatever it is, it's that thing. Whoever it is, it's that person that you allow to steal your joy. It's that person or situation that you allow to determine just how spiritually mature you are. Paul speaks of joy. Since it's a part of what is produced in our lives, if we are filled with the Spirit, if we walk with the Spirit, Joy is produced. If there is no joy, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is you're not walking with the Spirit. Here in this letter, and also in the book of the letter of 1 Thessalonians, he tells us to rejoice always. We're instructed to rejoice all the time. We are to, instructed to rejoice in all things. We are instructed to rejoice in all circumstances. So in theory, there should be no breaking point, no time when we're not rejoicing. If we are to rejoice all the time in all things and all circumstances, we should have that joy all the time. There should be no point in life for the believer where joy is forfeited. That doesn't mean that we don't grieve when there's death, but that doesn't mean that we give up joy in our grief. There's no... There should be no time of bitterness. There should be no time of negativism or, or sullenness because those things aren't a part of who we are anymore. We don't allow those things to control our lives anymore. We are being transformed by the power of God because we are walking with the Spirit. And when we walk with the Spirit, we will produce joy in our lives. Well, Dan Paul is saying that the loss of joy is because of the entrance of sin. We talked about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, when we were talking about the house rules of God, family rules of God. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, but all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Let these be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you in Christ Jesus. All that other stuff has gone away. It's not a part of who we are anymore. We recognize that sin has entered and stolen our joy. We should, with the psalmist, cry out, hide your face from uh, my sins. Blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me what? A clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the what? The joy of your salvation. Uphold me in your generous spirit. Sin is a thief. Our own sinful reactions uh, to circumstances in our lives, it steals joy. We allow temporary physical circumstances to, to throw us off balance, to steal our joy, to replace it with bitterness, confusion, trials, hard time. Uh, disagreements, unfulf unfulfilled ambitions. We let all these things control who we are rather than we controlling our response to them. 
As Christians, we are people who are called to set our minds, set our thoughts on things above, but too often we just keep them here on the earth. And we lose our joy. Oh, don't forget, and keep reminding you of this. All speaks of joy, his joy as he sits in prison four years falsely accused. If anybody had the right to sulk, it was Paul. Yet the very one who teaches us to rejoice always and to set our mind on things above to rejoice and continue rejoicing is the one who rejoiced in these terrible circumstances. Jesus says, in the world, you will have trouble. Expect it. Doesn't mean we lose our joy, just expect it, be prepared for it. My brethren, count it all joy, what? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing what? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How do you do that? By not allowing something or that thing, your trial, to steal your joy. Joy has a divine purpose, or not joy, but the, the trial has divine purpose. Expect that there will be trials, and expect that God is using that trial for the purpose of making you a better person, making you perfect and complete. Paul told the Corinthians, the reason that God gave me trouble was so that I could learn how to give you comfort. Listen to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For the sufferings, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation. The, the word there, consolation, is uh, paraclesis, to, to, to call the side like a mother calls her child uh, to her side to comfort her. So is our consolation abounds through Christ. Now, if we are affected, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is uh, effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer, or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. God has profound purposes for bringing affliction, bringing trials, and bringing difficulties into the life of the Christian. He does not intend to take our joy. He intends to strengthen our joy. He intends to increase our endurance. He intends to uh, teach us how to comfort others so that we might have joy. The key to having or maintain, uh, is to maintain, or the key to maintaining joy is to have a spirit controlled perspective. When trial comes into your life, when difficulty comes into your life, rather than reacting to it in, in violence or anger or sullenness or whatever, think, oh, God's working on me. This, this painful situation is given that God might make me stronger. When we begin to think on things above or using the things above to control our thinking when we begin to allow the spirit to transform our lives to truly transform who we are when we go through suffering we will go through it recognizing god is doing something that's going to be for my benefit the key is for perspective the key is to to yield to the spirit of god not to be overtaken by the difficult when we're transformed we see these things see them from god's perspective your joy is taken because you <laughs> kicked a sleeping dog and the sleeping dog bit you, then don't say, oh, God was trying to teach me something there. No, that was just stupidity. And you don't need to look for some meaning from God when the dog bit you because you kicked the dog. In the same light, if you if your joy is taken because you married a, a drunker, drunkard, 
and the drunkard remains a drunkard and begins eventually to treat you like a drunken man often treats his wife. Don't ask, what's God doing to me? What am I supposed to be learning from this? I don't understand why God is, what God is trying to teach me. God was trying to teach you before you married the drunkard. But you did it anyway. You married the drunkard in regardless of his will. Don't look for some divine instruction in that situation. My friend and sister, who now passed, Edna, wonderful Christian lady that we baptized not long, one of our first converts in, in Russia. She became a Christian late in life, and early in life, uh, she married a man that wasn't good. I don't know the circumstances behind her getting married is not important. But as she grew as a Christian lady, she came to us, or she told us, she said, had I known early in life what I know in Christ, I would not have married that man. The great thing about Edna is that she did not let her past mistakes and the continuing consequences of that mistake in her life, she did not let it steal her current joy. She was one of our most faithful and dedicated members, even though he didn't want it or like it or have nothing to do with it. Christianity did not take away the bad man from her life, but it did bring her comfort in her bad situation. Anna's walk with the Spirit brought her true joy, brought her true comfort in bad circumstances that she lived in. She was, I believe, a, a true saint, is a true saint. She's the Lord now. As we watch the life of Paul, as, as revealed in the scriptures, he, like everybody, becomes a, a model for us. He was not perfect, but he was a man whose joy knew almost no breaking point. There was not something, this is not something that he learned from the world. Rather, it's evidence of him being transformed by the Spirit of God as he laid himself upon the altar of God to be transformed. Think of all the times that Paul could have allowed physical circumstances to steal his joy. Beatings, shipwreck, prison, being outcast from his own people, being thrown out of cities. None of it caused him to turn against his God and shake his fist. All of it was allowed to produce joy joy of service. I'm glad that God gave me this trial because this trial has made me a stronger person. But because of this trial, the gospel has gone forth as a result of there's a man of perspective. There's a man whose perspective is honed and trained by the spirit of God in which he lives or who lives in him. His circumstance as he, he speaks of, of this is, is, is miserable. He's, he's in prison, but he speaks of joy. Joy as he's ask, asking or making requests for someone else, prisoner in Rome. I recall that for a number of years he had longed to go to Rome. He says, I long to come to you, Romans chapter uh, 1, verse 9. I plan to come to you, verse 9. I am ready, chapter 13. I, I, I'm ready to come to you and preach the gospel to you. At the end of the epistle, he says, I want to come to you and, and, and set up a base so that I can uh, go from you to Spain. It was his. Uh, evangelistic spirit and desire to preach the gospel that drove his desires to come to him. But now that he's there, that long time desire has come to pass. He's, he's in Rome. He's not there under the conditions that he would have designed for himself. He's up there with joy. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, I hope to have a prosperous journey to come to you. That's not what he had. Had a very painful journey. The journey was not without tremendous difficulty. Arrested, accused, threatened, jail, dungeon in uh, Caesarea for a couple of years, shipwrecked, swimming for his life, two year imprisonment in Rome. It's been at least four years since the uh, Philippians had seen Paul, more likely close to 10. But at some point, Word had wafted down to, uh, to, to get to the Philippian church that he was in jail because they loved him so deeply. There was a unique 
bond between Paul and the Philippian church. They were very compassionate, very sympathetic to him. They wanted to send uh, him uh, money. They sent him the brother of Epaphroditus from the congregation. Paul has joy, even in the worst of circumstances. He realizes that God's work is going on, even though he's in prison. I didn't come to Rome like I wanted to, but I came to Rome. And I'm here under the bequest of God. I'm here accomplishing the word of God. I'm here doing things that could never have been done had I not come to God or come to Rome in this way. So when Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, he's writing in response to their request, I think, their desires. They're wanting to know more about him. Are you okay? He's saying, no, I'm not really that okay, but that's okay. What's being accomplished here is the will of God, and that makes it okay. The key to Paul's success is found in verse 18, of chapter 1. I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Literal translation, I am rejoicing, and I shall be rejoicing. Underline that passage in your Bible. I am rejoicing. And I shall be rejoicing. That's what he wants them to know. Why? Partly because it's true, partly because he does not want them to worry about him. My prayers, verse 4, are for you filled with joy. Verse 17 of chapter 2, I share, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Don't be sad. Don't be sorrowful on my account. Don't fret for me. Rejoice. I'm rejoicing, you rejoice. The joy of ministry. It's a joy that we all need to learn. Paul had a joy of ministry, even though the ministry sometimes was most difficult. All right, we're about out of time. Um, well, I want to go ahead and do this. The rest of our time will start afresh next week. Um, Paul's joy uh, was not related to circumstances. One of the things I've been trying to point out is that it, it, if his joy was related to or dependent upon circumstances, he would not have had any joy. If his joy was related to pleasures on earth, he would not have had any joy. If his joy was related to possessions in this world, he would have no joy. If his joy was related to, to freedom, he would have no joy because he didn't have freedom. If his joy was related to prestige, he would not have any joy. If his joy was related to outward success, no joy. If his joy was related to good reputation, no joy, because he didn't have that. And that caused him problems among the Corinthians. That's what the book of 2 Corinthians is about. It was all related to something completely other than that. Paul's joy was in the knowledge that he was serving the God of heaven. The joy of ministry. The joy of ministry is the joy of of knowing that you are in service to the God of heaven, to the God of the universe. Whatever happens, it's a matter of joy because you know God knows best. In Paul's last words to encourage Timothy, that was the essence of his message. And I want to close tonight just by reading some of the words that Paul wrote to Timothy as he was facing the martyr's acts. He's not just in prison. This time he's in prison knowing he's going to die. And the, the uh, situation of that imprisonment was much more miserable than what his situation is now. But he never lost his joy or his faith. Listen to Paul as we close. Second Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. He's Paul writing to Timothy trying to encourage him, though he's about to give his own life, Paul's trying to encourage Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of fear, Timothy. He's given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of me as a prisoner. Come and share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us, who has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, with which, he has, uh, which was given in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of the Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, 
brought life to immortality through the gospel. I'm not afraid of death. Death's been abolished. And life is, I mean, immortality has been brought to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this, I suffer, for, for this reason, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I suffer these things for the gospel of Christ. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to that day. Verse 8 of chapter 2, remember that Jesus Christ is the seed of David, or the seed of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to the gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change. But the word of God, Timothy, it's not changed. Therefore, because it's not changed, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus uh, with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, worthy of being accepted by all. We shall reign with him. If we deny him, uh, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He will deny himself. In other words, if we deny him and become faithless, he's not going to have anything to do with us. But if you reign with him, if you die with him, you will live with him, you will reign with him. Chapter 4, verse 6, I am ready to be offered... We poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I finished the uh, race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give uh, not only to me in that day, but to all those who love this. I'm not afraid. In my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. Verse 16. May it not be laid charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that the Gentiles, all the Gentiles, might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Nothing stole Paul's joy. He is before the martyr's axe. They're sharpening the blade as he's writing these words. And he knows it. He's not afraid. It's not taken. All right, we'll stop there. We'll begin uh, next week. I want to talk some more. I want to skip through, uh, actually, the next several verses uh, and get down to the, uh, well, we'll just do it next week. But uh, I'm not going to go in detail like we've done today over the next part of the chapter, just because I want to get more of the chapter done. But next week, we've got uh, two hours to try to wrap it up. But thank you for your attention. Thank you for being a part of the class. I hope that uh, tonight's uh, lesson or tonight's uh, teaching has been uh, beneficial and profitable to you. Have a good night and have a good weekend. <laughs>